All right, team, welcome back to Rethink Real Estate. Um, I always enjoy catching up with Aaron. Um, this is a fast moving and a dynamic conversation around many things. We tried to make it a little bit about planning, um, but I got went down a few rabbit holes as well. Um, so hopefully it's of benefit to everybody that's involved in listening. Uh, but that said is that I think that we talk about some really good dynamic changes that are coming up in the industry. Um, you know, a little bit of a recap of 2023. What do we think 2024 is going to do? Aaron's got a really interesting, you know, view on the space because of his affiliation with mortgage and also real estate. He sees the both of them together together in that middle ground. And that's where I personally really enjoy his perspective on where things are going and what's happening. But then the other part that we dive into a little bit deeper is the different models in real estate, um, some leadership stuff, and finally, some business planning elements towards the end. Hopefully it's valuable and hopefully you enjoy. Welcome to Rethink Real Estate. My name is Ben Brady, and this is a real estate podcast aimed to deliver sales strategies, marketing tips, and business insights from industry experts and myself to build a listing-focused business for the future. Let's get into it. Well, Aaron, welcome back to Rethink Real Estate. My pleasure. Mate, uh, number two podcast with uh, with me, which is great. You and I speak relatively frequently, anyway. So, uh, so I feel like we're just catching up, really. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's like what did you do last weekend? Yeah, yeah that's right. I know how it feels. That's right. But hey, a bit of context for for people is that we're recording this at the end of 2023 um, because we want to release it in 2024 from a business planning perspective. The thing that I really enjoy about your connection to the marketplace um, Mm -hmm. is that you see the the mortgage world and you see both the real estate world in pretty high volume and high capacity. You just mentioned that you've done so many business plannings, you could probably do this session with your eyes closed at the moment, um, just with the volume that you're doing. So I just want a bit of a synopsis from you to begin with, mate. Um, um, as like, what was your, what, like, if you could summarize, you know, 2023 within, you know, a couple of sentences, how would you summarize that? And what do you think 2024 looks like? Interesting. But, and I mean, probably doesn't, it's not going to take a couple of sentences. It might take one word more than anything. And I mean, let, let's be really honest. It was shit. It was like the, was I, knew, un- I just knew it. I just knew you'd say <laughs> it. But in saying that, though, Ben, it was shit for a couple of reasons, and it wasn't, hey, the market was what the market was. Let's be really honest. It was what it was, but then there's also the other question, then why were people still doing really good volume? And I think it was crap from a standpoint that I saw way too many people sitting back hoping there was going to be a change. There was nobody being really proactive about it, and both sides of the world, mortgage and real estate, were all doing the same things. And the only thing I really say it was it was crap was because it was very unpredictable. Like nobody had really been through something like this before. So there was a lot of stagnant, what am I going to do? So it sort of stopped people from trying some new stuff. Um, but in, all, in saying that too, though, I think it's also created one of the greatest opportunities that this industry is probably going to see because, mm. you know, there's no secret behind it. We did need a significant clean out. We needed to sort of reshape the industry a little bit. We had way too long of the glory days and, you know, an unprecedented, um, you know, pandemic and things like that, and everybody making more money than what they knew what to do with in 2020 and 2021. And that just created a whole ton of bad habits. In my mind, people got lazy, we didn't really look a little too much further than what we're doing week in, week out. So there's two ways to look at it from a from a real estate market perspective, pretty crappy, but from an opportunity to change what you're doing, it became one of the best opportunities ever. Uh, and the reason we were just talking about been doing a ton of business plans. Now's when you should be doing it. Yeah, I mean, I know this is not going to come out till early next year, but there's a big focus on like we got to get ready. And I think the lack of preparation is always the reason I think a lot of people fail is we sort of wait to see a change before we make a move. We should be doing it now. You know, we've been going through this process for the last couple of months, getting ready for whatever that market's going to look like. There's no time frame on when it's going to shift, but we damn well want to be ready for it when it does. Mm. So, you know, planning has a lot of different versions in it. Um, but, you know, obviously what I'm seeing in the market, you know, working a lot with the lending side of things, we're really starting to see a bit of confidence come back. And something I was just sharing with you, we're starting to see a lot of people, you know, homeowners that are now going and getting pre-approved for what their next step will be, should there start be a little bit of a reprieve in the market and the rates. So we're starting to see people make moves. Now, they're not necessarily making the move today. And these are the people that are going to be our sellers. They're going to be our clients in you know, February, March, April, May, and we need to be in front of them now. And so I'm a bit lucky that I get a little bit of that insight, but we've always known it's going to be coming. And we've had, what, 30 days with consistent sort of decreases in the rates. Uh, I'm probably on the other side of it, Ben, where I don't think we need to see rates come down into the fires before we see it take off. I think we just need some consistency of it not going like a heartbeat. 
And that's just going to give people confidence to be able to make a move knowing that it's not going to fly up to the 12s. But, you know, we are confidently going to see that thing start to, you know, slowly start to tick down in 2024. But the smart sellers are going to do it before that. You know, they're going to do it while they're still low inventory. They're going to make a move. But we just need to start that a little earlier. We, you know, we need to be part of that conversation now. So, you know, honestly, buddy, I'm not seeing much more than just positivity. Um, yeah. You know, if you if you go look for it, but it's also one of those things. If you want to go and you know leverage on something negative, there's a whole bucket full of stuff you can go look at that'll support what you're trying to excuse. Well, let's, but, well, let's mm. let's lean into that a little bit. I want to talk negative because again, we can always be positive, and I don't want people to think that you know yeah. at the end of the day we're gonna you and I are always you and I are glass the glass is half full type of people. Yeah. But I want to talk about just uh, just quickly why you mentioned that, mate. I I want to I want to just. Can you see something that derails? Like, I, I think you're right. I think that the rates are going to come down. Like, I listening legitimately to a podcast on the way the work this morning, and mm-hmm. um, Scott Galloway he does this office hours thing, and I really like it. And it was a lady. It was a lady that actually phoned in and and asked a question that, hey, look, I've got me and my husband are very religious around around saving. Um, we've mm-hmm. got a a relief fund, like an emergency fund, where we've got twelve months worth of what we would need to live off. Um, we've got also then we've got. Um, a stock account and all of this type of stuff. Like we've just gotten to the point that we are impatient and we want to buy a house because we've just had a child. Regardless of what rates are, we we know that we can always refinance. Where should I take the money from? It wasn't a question about whether they should buy next year. It was a question of like, I'm buying. I don't give a shit where the rates are. Where do I take the money from was the question, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and and I think that that's where we're getting to with people at this point, mate. Like I think that people are just going to get to that impatient element and that's great. But I want to look at, I want to look at, I want to go and not just focus on that. I want to focus on what can you see? Is there anything in the horizon that you can see that might derail 2024 for the year that we're expecting it to be a bit better than 2023? Can you see any derailment from somewhere that uh, I know it's a shit question because there might be several, but whatever. Well, no, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, and I think it's, you know, and, and technically when we say derail our industry, I mean, our industry, we can look at it two ways, where it's the real estate market, the sales process, or it's our industry as a whole. Mm. Um, and two sides of that, I don't think there's anything that could derail our industry from a sales standpoint, because, mm. you know, there's no secret behind it that, it's like there's, and don't quote me on the number, but I know it's between 80 and 90%, but between 80 and 90% of every single real estate transaction that happens, happens for an emotional reason. It's not a, you know, an economic transaction. Yep. It's people passing away, it's divorces, it's kids moving away, downsizing, fine. So that's always going to be a part of our market. But from an industry standpoint, I mean, I think some of these, you know, these lawsuits and things like that is, is creating a lot of fear in agents. And I'll be honest with you, buddy, you just got to get the hell over it because it's one of those things you can't control. And it's something that's always been a fundamental of this business. If you're a buyer's agent, you're always going to be at the mercy of what goes on around you. You have very limited control. Now, we work with a lot of buyer's agents, so there's ways to strategize and help with that. But the only real safe place in our industry is controlling the listings, You know, having yeah. a listing agreement, having a contract, having the ability to control your income. Now, if you're a listing agent, any of this stuff isn't really going to have an impact on your business. But it does flip back to one thing, Ben, and I'm, I'm kind of glad you brought it up, is that for years, realtors have been one-trick ponies. We've got one little thing that we're good at. That's about it. This is not the industry as a whole. You're going to have to have different options for everybody. Everybody's going to want something different. And actually, just a conversation I had earlier this morning with one of my uh, realtor clients on the East Coast was that he's very stubborn in the way he wants to run his business. He goes, this is the way I'm going to run my business. And I said, well, it's no longer your choice. Your clients, the community, everybody that's looking to hire you has something that they want. And if you don't have it, they're going to go somewhere else. Yep. And something that's always been a fundamental philosophy of any sort of great business is you have options, you know, like being able to say, look, there's three or four different ways that we can help you. I mean, we created a a 90 day pre-listing process that we actually took clients through creating motivation, you know, just to to get them into the fundamental fields of selling where every single realtor at the moment and for the last three or four years has just lived off instant gratification. If I can't get what I want today, screw you, I'm moving on to the next person. That shit has to change. And I think the only thing that could put a lot of pressure on, on our industry is the perception of realtors, which I think is also a great opportunity because you don't have to do much to change it. I mean, if all we've got to do is change what people think are realtors, you know, that's not a hard thing to change. So, you know, so I think it creates a lot more opportunities, but it's not for the faint of heart. Like you talked about having some patience and, you know, everybody gets a little impatient to do things. Realtors are the most impatient people ever because, number one, we don't run a business. We're talking yeah. business planning. You know, we wing it every single day we get up. What am I going to do? There's no plan behind it. Yep. So, you know what? Maybe there's a little bit more thinning out that's going to happen just because people have looked at this as a bit of a part-time gig. It's really not a full-time career. 
Um, so the thing I can see changing is the average income of the agent is going to go through the roof, but that disparity between the ones at the bottom and the ones at the top is just going to get wider and wider. It's you know, funny so you just yeah. develop options. It's funny that you say that, mate. Like, like I think that I think that there's 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 an episode that I'm going to be doing for uh, uh, you know sooner rather than later that I've been I've been whether whenever it comes out if it's already been out then it's already been out whatever. But mm-hmm. the the thing that I, I like everybody loves the concept of auction. They really mm-hmm. love that in the very first degree of it. They're like, great, I can present something different and I can preside something different. Aaron, the, the the episode that I'm doing is trying to talk people out of doing it, and the reason I'm doing that is because. The, the, the name of the episode will be, do you really want to be different? And the reason mm-hmm. I say that is that everybody loves the idea of being different. But when it comes to the reality of the things that you've got to deal in doing things differently, like a great example is that our company has been built, basically the foundation of it has been built off the auction concept of, and that is friction mm-hmm. towards traditional real estate. And, mm-hmm. and I've got to be honest, 90% of people that end up doing it can't handle the friction of being different. Yeah. yeah, that's so true. Uh, I mean, you just can let that statement sit there for a little bit. You know, everybody wants to stand out from a crowd, but we don't want anybody to see us. You know, and I, and I, but I mean, you can you can package that up being different as having options. And I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm a you know big believer. You know, I mean, I'm a passionate believer in in the auction process for a couple of probably different reasons to you. I know it's probably it's the oldest form of selling real estate, but it's also the one form of real estate that removes all the crap, removes all the the fingers in the pie in my mind. And, you know, there's an old quote that everybody's always used, you know, let buyers buy and sellers sell. It's actually one of the only processes that kind of lets people do that and may the best man win, who woman win, whoever's got the most amount of money does it. And I will say this with my hand on my heart, Ben, that I believe that probably 90% of all transactions that go sideways are because of the realtors that are fighting for commission. It's got nothing to do with the actual transaction. It's people trying to be a little creative. Um, and it's interesting that you say that, though, because that's a big fundamental part of it. I think, you know, we talk about being different, but actually very few realtors know what their point of difference is. Mm. And trying to discover what makes me better than somebody else or what makes one realtor different to the other, they lean on just traditional scripts and dialogues. And people really don't care what we've got to say. They want to see what we're going to do. And I think the biggest opportunity that we've got moving forward is we're no longer going to be in a tell me market. Don't tell me what you're going to do. Show me exactly what makes you different. And very few people can put their hand up and go, look, this is my point of difference. I have these things. I do these five different avenues. And so one thing we're always focusing on is show people what you do. Share your communication plan. Share the difference of what it takes to run your business. Because if people don't think we're worth it, show them what we do. Because 90% of people wouldn't know what a realtor does day in, day out. Um, I actually think it's easy to find your point of difference and actually stand out from a crowd because you actually don't have to do very much at the moment to actually stand out. I mean, the average realtor's going backwards at such a great rate of knots is that maybe just showing up and answering the phone is going to be a unique point of difference. It's sad, but true. Um, I'm sort of glad you brought that up because it is a very hot topic at the moment is I think people aren't so much about getting being different and finding a point of difference. They're just terrified of being uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's what, yeah, they, they, there's this comfort zone of, you know, I like doing certain things. I mean, you and I've talked about this many times. It's like lead gen. Everybody knows it doesn't bloody work, but it's comfortable because there's no face to face interaction. There's no human interaction. And one thing that I've been stressing to people at the moment, there is one thing that you need to get in this business right now. And if you don't get it, you're going to go broke. And that's an interaction with a person. You need to get an emotional response. And 90% of the stuff that we use forces away that emotional reaction. I mean, you yeah. know, it when you do an auction, you can see the buy, you can see who's motivated and you're playing off the human reaction. So yeah. it's just getting back to some old traditional things that we know produces a result where we can actually engage and have some sort of reaction. And I think most of it's just getting uncomfortable, buddy. It's just doing things we just don't want to do. Well, so, so this is a little bit of an off camber question, mate, um, is that um, I think that you know, obviously I want to get into the planning stages. My next question after this will be, you know, around the lines of like, what do we see people make mistakes at when they plan and blah, blah, blah. But the, um, there's two things that I've noticed as we come towards, you know, 2024, there's two separate companies at this point. Um, and what I mean by that is like real estate models. Yep. There's the EXPs, the reels of the world that are pay as little as possible, have as little help as possible, do all of this hype and 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 all of this stuff, which again I don't know, I don't I don't agree with. But then there's the other side of this where you know you've got Robert Revkin and and mm-hmm. Compass that are making a full court press at being this brick and mortar 
high frequency, high touch, come into the office sort of brand and getting into that connection space a little bit further. You've got obviously the people in the middle and all of this type of stuff, but I, I've never seen such you know, vast differences in opinions, typically from publicly traded companies like the Reels EXPs and the and the compasses, they usually tow some type of line where they can take a bigger percentage of the market and like don't denigrate yeah. one portion of it, um, you know, but they've really gone, no, 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 we want as many bodies as we possibly can in the real and the XP space, which I don't agree with, but then Compass has gone with the whole, no, 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 we're going brick and mortar, we're going high frequency, high touch, we're going, you know, physical location and still keeping very, very traditional mindset. Like, I don't think there's a right or wrong reason, but do you have an opinion on that at this point and why they're doing it? Oh, hell yeah. I mean, it's a numbers game, Ben. I mean, it's, it, and it's, and you know, you and I have obviously done a lot of real estate in countries outside of the US where the populations aren't that big and you don't generally get the option of just, you know, turn and burn through as many agents as possible. But no. I think my business head comes on when I think about this and I always think about from a business standpoint, is it easier for me to get 20% more agents or add 20% to the bottom line of what I've got? What's more profitable? What actually works? It's a very simple answer. I mean, if you add more money to, you know, the people that are already working for you, make more money. You can't do it in that model. But I think it's a it's been a natural progression when the average income of the realtor starts to drop, you realize you've got to have more people. And so for me, I don't look at them like real estate models. I look at them like memberships. You know, it's like the more people you sign up, they pay a little bit every month, the more money you make. But maybe the thing that we should be looking at is what has been the most sustainable model over the last 30 years. And it's been the traditional real estate brokerage that adds support. Um, we actually did a survey about three or four months ago, actually, just to get an insight into what all of our students were looking for in 2024. Yeah, Thinking- and just to, just to remind everybody, Aaron, about Sellwell, I, I think yeah. that they need to understand that if they're not understanding where you get your data from, Sellwell mm-hmm. is your online program that ultimately yeah. helps people all the way through in marketing platform. And you've got a very high volume of agent that uses yes. that. So, so, and you've got to be doing a decent amount of business to be able to use it as well. And, and mm-hmm. not to mention also newer agents and more experience. You've got a whole mix. So I think your yeah. data is pretty accurate. Yep. So we've got a bit of a tiered system. We have a membership where people can come on for the support, um, very low cost thing. And then we move into the one-on-ones as people grow through their business. So it's not a, just a one size fits all. It's a bit of a, you know, grot across the board. And uh-huh. you knowing me, I'm a, I like facts. I'm a bit more of a show me what's going on rather than tell me. And we did a, a survey probably middle of last year, I think. And we surveyed about 6,000 agents about what they thought was going to be their most required thing. And we sort of, you know, worded the question a little bit tricky. So um, it was trying to push people into a thing, you know, whether it was going to be lead sources, whether whatever it was going to be. And I, I just generally thought we were going to have to go down the lead route of actually having something that was going to bring people in, but not any want to do that at all. About 85% of the responses we got said leadership. And I was quite taken back from it because one of the things that those types of models do is that understand that a major portion of our industry you know, whether they're you know, at 100% shop or whatever it is, their one unique common flaw is they don't know how to run a business. They're probably pretty good at selling real estate, but running a business is something that you need support to do. And it was interesting just seeing that a lot of these people that have gone to these 100% places, their businesses have failed miserably because of the fundamentals of running a business. There's no structure, there's no setup, there's no getting up every day and being consistent with what you do. That's something that you'll always get in a traditional bricks and mortar brokerage because you get up, you go to work, you've got a place to go. Um, but I also understand it's not for everybody. And I also think those models have been developed because historically real estate in the US has been a part-time gig. That's really what it was founded around. And they also realized that they could get a ton of people through. Now, I know it's always the first adopters of those make a ton of money. I know there's a couple more floating out now. But interesting, one of the things we are seeing, Ben, is that we have a lot of realtors from all different models. We have traditional, we have a lot of EXP, real, we have from all over. The biggest jumping ship model that we see is the EXPs and the reels. They go in for a year, they start to struggle. You know, it's very hard being you know under pressure on your own. Um, so we're starting to see a big transition back into some traditional models. You know, so it's it's a timestamp thing. Yeah. Um, but I mean, if you look at the last ten years, those you know those sort of models aren't new, and they just generally don't last for too long. Um, one of the impacts that I do see, actually, to go back on your first question, one of the most significant impacts that I can see happening over the next twelve months is the discount brokerage will disappear. Yeah, because it's going to be fundamentally impossible to keep your business going if we start hitting 60 days plus on the market. And obviously, with these commission issues, that's probably one of the big things that will happen. But yeah, um, honestly, buddy, I think there's a model out there for everybody. And I think everybody needs to try it. But you're not seeing a lot of longevity and staying power in, in some of these 
a little bit more I, flippant models. I just, I like, like, mate, I, I've like, like with our with our real estate business, you know, Harcourt's better than most because you ran it for a while and you set it up. But mm. but uh, but the the part of it that I just I don't know that I could do if I was an EXP or a real. And and by the way, you and I both know the people who run it quite well. Mm. And yes. and you know, at the end of the day, we speak to them. And and again, great people, like awesome mm. people coming from the right place. But the 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 part that I just don't know that I could get around if I was in that leadership role is knowing that you're basically paying me X. And if I help you, I don't see any upside to that. Or there's no, there's no reason for me to help you. There's no, there's, there's every reason to build hype around my business so that therefore it's an attraction point. But after that, there's actually no reason for me to help you succeed further. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no want to either. And I think what, what you've just said there is probably exactly nailed it on the head is that, you know, when you go to a traditional brokerage, they get paid when you sell more homes. We all make more money when more homes sell. You go to that type of model what you said is exactly right. Once you're on, there is no want, no need to ever want to talk to you ever again because there's no value in me helping you grow your business. Mm-hmm. And so the focus all becomes about bringing on more bodies. And that's mm-hmm. really, I mean, that's the only way they make money. Hey, it's a business. It's got to make money. So that's where their focus has to be. So unless you're in a completely a 100% self-sufficient business where you need absolutely nothing, that yeah. model is a real struggle for the average real. 80% yeah. of our industry is an individual agent you know, getting out there doing their own thing. We need help. We need support. If you don't have it, it's going to be a real struggle. But I think what you said is exactly right. It's not a, it's not even a want or a need. There's just no desire to help somebody when there's no benefit in it. I know that's a pretty crappy sort of a value, but you also got to understand that's the business model. That's a business that's model. The yeah, you make. That's what you got to deal with. Yeah. Um, mm. Interesting. And I know, I know that I'm all, I'm off topic again here, but I made, I think that I, I, you and I always enjoy sitting down and philosophizing about real estate, <laughs> but, um, yeah. but I, but I think that, I think that there's, a, there's something that you said just before when you were going through the discovery of what your model is with sell well. Um, mm. And, and you said something about when you did the survey that you were thinking like, do I have to provide leads? Not knowing like not wanting to do that, but is that the type of thing? And then when you did the survey, they wanted leadership. It's funny mm. though, like, like, like there's probably people that are sitting here at the moment or listening to this podcast going, oh, that's bullshit. They don't want leadership and whatever. But I was thinking to myself, as you said it, why is it that I don't even believe that as well? And it's sort of like the reason why is because I think that one of the things that we all try to do in this transient industry, okay, is we try to find levels of control of the people that are in it, right? And I can say, well, Aaron, you're an agent with me and I give you all your business, so you're fucked without me essentially, (laughs) okay? So therefore, that's the type of hold that I want on you and that Mm -hmm. falsified relationship will never be built. I think that people shy away from actual good leadership skills and trying to build that within their business or build that good culture. Another word that, you know, is overused, but that leadership and culture element is so important is because that is the one thing that is not a, it, it's not a tangible control element. Like mm-hmm. it has to continue to show up for people to continue to see value. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's a really difficult pe- thing for people to understand is that it's the most wanted thing, but it's probably the least thing that people pay attention to because there's so little control in it. Yeah. And it's, and, and funny enough for me, when we, when we actually sent it out there, like I said, the way we worded the question um, is most people think leadership is somebody controlling what I'm doing. I, I don't need a boss. Hey, we're independent contractors. We run our own bloody businesses. And I think the fact that if anybody reacts to that one word, then you need to take a bloody good look in the mirror because it's not leadership. What people are actually asking for because of the way that was worded was support, a place to go and freaking air my issues and talk to somebody about what I'm struggling about. And so for me, that leadership word become non-existent. It was just, I need to be supported when I'm having a bad day because nobody's around you when things are tough. You'll have all the friends in the world when you're selling 10 homes a month. You won't see a single soul when you've had three months without selling a property. I guarantee you, none of these people are coming to help you. And we sort of packaged it up that way for a reason. I mean, our biggest fundamental change is we were doing live coaching calls twice a month. The first thing we changed is we started doing it every week because, and everybody... I mean, our our viewership just went through the roof because people just needed to be around other people. One of the biggest negatives that we had with 2020 and 2021, we got so isolated. It was just survive on your own. You know, and this is probably why I think you and I are probably a little bit more leaning into the the compass types models is because culture and 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 leadership or support drives production, always has, always will. And if you don't know what to do and you're sitting at home on your own, you still don't know what to do. You know, you get into an office with people that are active, go figure, you'll start to work something out. So 
you know, that's kind of where that comes from. But for me, it was always going back to that one thing. They don't need to be told what to do, but sometimes they need support in what they're going through. And we've just come out of the back end of probably one of the most struggling, challenging markets that every realtor's ever been through. Everybody talks about it. Not all doom and gloom what people are saying, but it's doom and gloom because you know what? You've been isolated on your own. You made the wrong bloody choice of where you wanted to go because you thought you could make more money paying less to somebody else. That model's never worked. If you want to grow a business, you give up a little bit and start selling more houses. I actually remember joking about this years ago. Every time one of my agents would come to me and ask for a pay rise, I go, 100%, I'll give you a pay rise, just sell more houses. <laughs> and they'd look at you like, well, I said, but you can't get paid more money for doing less work. No. <laughs> you know, so let's find a way to help you sell more houses. And I think what you just said is so true. It's like you've got to find your place. Um, and for me, support is the most critical thing is when you're having a bad day, you need someone to bitch and moan to. You and I do this to each other frequently. It's like you get it off your chest, you get on with it, and you move on. And sometimes that's just what we need. When you're struggling to air it with somebody and a broker that's on your side or a sales manager that can sit with you and give you some ideas, that's how you get out of that stuff quicker. Unfortunately, those models aren't really going to provide that because when you're not making any money, nobody wants to hear your crap. No, nobody no. wants to sit down and feel, you know, share how bad you're feeling. You just said something then that, you know, sort of goes, ac goes across like it sort of was a trigger. It's like you can't get paid more money for doing less work. It's so amazing how so many people try to do that. They try to, they try to, all right, well, this is where I'm at at the moment. Now, if I change a few of these things that, you know, then I can make more money. No, no, why don't you just, why don't you just do more? Like, why don't you just mm -hmm. elevate that? Like, it's such a, it's such a cultural thing. It's such a, I don't know. It's just such a mindset within people where they're like, oh, well, no, yeah. I want to keep doing the same amount, but earn more. It's like, oh dear. Yeah. Okay. That's a, that's a problem indeed. It's like Which a realtor that comes to you, Ben, and says, look, you know, I had a really tough year. So now I'm going to go start selling luxury homes. Now, no, don't want to be rude to anybody, but if you sucked at selling $300,000 homes, you're going to suck at selling million dollar homes as well. And for me, that's the, the change just needs to be a volume based thing. More people, more conversations, more transactions. And you know, sometimes the most valuable thing you can have is someone that's not going to listen to your bullshit. Someone that's going to sit down and say, put your big boy pants on, let's get out there and do something different. You don't get that when you're sitting in a, you know, one of these, you know, places. But there is, that model does suit some people, not everybody, not the bulk yeah. of our industry. Um, you're starting to see what's happening with them as well. But, you know, I think for the intention of this, the one thing I will say, though, is if that's in your mind and you are thinking about something like that, do your bloody research. Look at all the different options. And one thing we insist with all of our people, we don't, we're not affiliated with anybody for a reason, but we'll give people guidance. We'll give them ideas on questions to ask brokerages, but it's a minimum of, of interviewing three brokerages before you make a decision. Go for the yeah. different options. You've got to find what works for you. And if you choose to go somewhere because you think it's the best option, you'll, you'll do really good things with it. Or if you go somewhere just because you think it's the best deal money-wise, you're going to fail miserably there as well. And obviously, granted, part of what we're talking about is business planning. And if you're thinking to picking up now and moving somewhere else to solve your problems, if you haven't fixed your business, congratulations, you're just going to take those problems somewhere else. So, yeah. you know, do the research. I mean, everything's got some value, but you just got to work out what value is for you. What, where are you yeah. at in your business? What do you need? What sort of help support do you need? So, you know, if you don't like the leadership thing, you don't need a leader. Maybe you need a mentor to kick your ass when you're, you know, you're still starting to believe your own crap. So, well, I think that, it. yeah, but in that, but in that shopping process, mate, I think yeah. that as we sort of stem deeper into the planning side of things, I think that we're going to talk about a few mistakes. Is that people mm -hmm. that think that the change is there. And like you and I have said this a million times before, and we're beating a dead horse with this comment, but grass typically isn't greener where we're over on the other side. It's green where you water it. But like mm -hmm. the, the, the fact is, is that, People usually go to the to the people that are already in an organization to understand what the organization's like. And unfortunately, the thing for them is that you've got to understand is that everybody's going to rationalize their own decision and why they are somewhere. And it's probably 90% of it's bullshit anyway, because they're rationalizing why they're there or why they're still there or why they moved there in the first place. Regardless of whether it's worse than where they were previously, they're still going to tell you it's the greatest place on, uh, on earth. So you, you find those case studies where people might have gone and then left or whatever it may be before you make that ultimate decision. Decision. Yeah. Ask some people. I mean, there's a variation to that. You know, the grass is always greener. So then, and there was a variation I saw not long ago saying the, maybe the grass is greener on the other side of the fence because that's where all the bullshit is. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Good this fertilizer. Is Good fertilizer. But, you know, and I, I think there's a lot of value to it, but I think the research is, I mean, hey, we can all be opinionated and it's like being part of a club. You're always going to believe what you want to believe. And you know, something that I've always become aware of is you'll always find evidence for the things that you want to believe. So if you believe something's going to be better, you'll find something that'll prove you right in your own head. 
Um, you'll also go the other way. If you want to believe something shit, you'll find you know, reasons to believe that as well. But you know, we're our own individual people. We've got to make our own bloody decisions. We're in this world of influence now where everybody's just trying to influence you on what you need to be able to do. But maybe the powerful thing is to not be influenced and make your own bloody decisions. We're all adults. We got into this business for freedom to do the things that we wanted to do, make as much money as possible. And then the minute we start this job, we do nothing. You know, yeah, that's a powerful, maybe it's powerful, time for some changes. Mm. Yeah, powerful statement. We get into it mm. for the autonomy and then ultimately that's the thing that hurts us. Yeah. So, yeah. so mate, so mate, talking about, let's talk about planning. So let's say I'm sitting down and I'm a realtor and I'm looking at my my business um, and I'm like, okay, great. I'm going to, I'm going to make some planning things or maybe I've already sat down and, and you've gotten ahead of it and you've done it in December and you're doing the right things and you're putting yeah. it all down. What do you think one of the biggest and most common mistakes is that people make when they first start that planning process for oh, 2024? So such a good question and i think and and i've got two things that i that i desperately want to share with you today because i think this is something that we've been focusing on for the last month or two and and i think the biggest mistake people make when they start business planning is they don't review what hasn't worked now we always look at the things that have worked that's great you know it's always there we go looking for the shiny lights but the month the number one thing we need to do right now is create space for whatever it is we're going to do in 2024 and if you take the same old crappy things that haven't produced results in 2023 you're going to get the same result in 2024 and so we actually break our business planning into two sessions now and the first session is all about removal let's go through every single thing that you've done in the last 12 months and burn the crap that hasn't worked is it your social media is it email marketing your communication plans lead sources, whatever it is that hasn't produced a significant result to make it worthwhile staying in your business, clean house. Because there's no way, I mean, every realtor you talk to right now will go through the same thing, crazy busy, I'm running around like a headless chook, great. Well, there's no point in me giving you anything new because all I'm going to do is encourage that chaos to go any further. So first step for anybody that's thinking about doing a business plan, before you start putting new stuff in, get rid of the crap that doesn't work. However, it does come with a little caveat, as this is the one time you need to be honest with yourself. I mean, if you spent 10 grand on something and it brought 10 grand in, know that is a colossal failure because it's the same money in, same money out. You know, if you're doing spending 10 grand on a marketing campaign and it's bringing in 50 grand in revenue, you know what? That's something that you can start looking at improving and doubling down on. And if we're not removing things that aren't working, then, and sometimes it's people, sometimes it's clients, sometimes it's a process, you know, then we're, we're flawed before we even get started. We have to yeah. create space to be able to add new things to be able to give it all of our energy to make it work. And, so and, I guess, and, and, I, and I guess a question for that, though, mate, like I think that one of the things that, you know, going through and doing business plan reviews with all of our agents that we do at the end of every year, you yep. know, the first thing is, yes, you do the review process. But the thing that I really am staggered with is people's lack of ability to track whether or not something was a good mm -hmm. ROI. They typically mm -hmm. just do things because they think that they should. And then they never track where ultimately the business comes from, or they make it like they don't, they probably don't want to know if that mm -hmm. makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we actually brought in a couple of processes, Ben, for that exact reason, because you're 100% right. I mean, realtors are notoriously blind-eyed. We get to Friday and go, thank God that's over, and we move into the next week. And so something we actually had to add to the business planning process was a weekly tracker of every single thing that you did so we could actually have real accurate data to actually you know, determine whether something stays. You know, tracking where your leads are coming from, tracking response times, tracking your email open rates, and then that way that gave us the ability to have a look at the content, what was going out. Hey, without you know real numbers, you're going to guess, and you're always going to guess that hey, you know nobody's been offended by it, so it's probably going to work. When if you haven't offended anybody, nobody's opening it. So I mean that's the reality behind it. So you're 100 percent right. You know we don't like to look at that sort of stuff, but we do it every single day. We have an end of the day process that we insist all of our clients do, which is 5:30, 6 o'clock every day. They go and review every single thing they've done. They make their calendar actual, so you can see exactly what your day looked like, and we highlight the crap. It's like the keep stop start thing that we did. 15 odd years ago as young fellas, you know, understanding what's actually producing revenue, what's not producing revenue, how do I limit the amount of hours that I spend on it? And if you do that consistently for 30 days, you'll know exactly what's causing you problems in your business. Mm. But it's also the hardest thing to do. And I always prep my clients by saying, you do this for two weeks on your own and don't call me because you're going to be pissed off at me when you start finding out what's costing you time and money in your business. But it becomes the biggest eye opener as most of the time we forget what we do every day and we don't see the flaws. We don't see the issues in the business. Hey, doing a business plan, sure, great, great idea. But if you're sitting down doing a dream board, that's not a business plan. <laughs> business plan is how do you run your business? I don't think a business plan should have numbers on it in the way of money. It should be all task driven because if everybody does exactly the same thing, you'll all have different income streams and different income amounts. But it's more about how you track it. You know, for me, the greatest business plan lasts for a week.
If you did it on Monday to Friday, you can't screw it up. You just look at what you've got to execute, what you've got to, you know, what you have to do. But going maybe going back to the question you asked me, what's the biggest flaw? The, probably one of the biggest flaws other than that review process is our always our biggest weakness is our ability to execute. So maybe we should teach ourselves how to do that first. And by doing shorter planning, you know, weekly targeting, maybe you know, setting some shorter goals so that you've got tighter time limits on getting it done is going to encourage that ability to execute what you put in front of yourself. Because, I mean, simple way to look at it, if you finished one thing perfectly every day for the next 12 months, where would you be? Yeah. Yeah, that's you know, right. I, mean, I don't think many of us have done two things. Do you have to? So you mentioned numbers there. See, I'm a big believer that re- reverse engineering your business plan is like figuring out what you want to do first, and then ultimately yes. then reverse engineer it from there. Is that is that a philosophy of you guys? Like, what what's the deal there? Yeah, hundred percent right, hundred percent right. I mean, my whole career has been built around taking things we already know how to do and rebuilding them to work for the individual. I mean, part of the reason we don't do half the stuff is because we don't like the way someone showed us how to do it. I mean, sure. for me, it was like I don't, you know, I love the concept, just don't like how you do it. Let's find a different way to do it. You know, so we've built different, you know, communication styles. We've got different open home strategies. You know, all, all different sort of client retention programs because it really is relative to the person and. Most of our life is just re-engineering things we've always known how to do. The things that have always consistently worked sometimes need some structural changes. I mean, honestly, door knocking. I mean, I would you probably struggle to find anybody that's knocked on more doors than me, but ring doorbells killed it for me because all I was doing was talking to cameras, you know. So it's not a real high conversion strategy. Great thing to do, but if I'm going to go out for two hours and talk to two cameras, I can find a lot of better things that I can do. So we just found different ways to do the same exercise without it having to be a physical door knock. So a lot of it is just about getting creative and re-engineering, like you said, things that we already know how to do. I mean, you and I, and, and you, you can definitely know this better than anybody, our life is about taking things that are working and then constantly improving them as things shift along with it. You know, if you put a great thing in your business 12 months ago and I've never changed it, it's flawed and doesn't work now. People move, yeah. people change, people get used to it. Yeah. So 100% agree with you, buddy. I mean, yeah, my business sort of consisted of four or five very consistent things that just kept changing with the markets, with what people were doing. You know, sometimes it's communication styles with new technology coming in, but you know, that's life. I think it's just re-engineering it. The one thing I would say, it needs to be done a lot more frequently than people are. Like for me, it's probably a 90-day cycle. We got to keep reviewing it, go back through, have a look. Is it yeah. still working? Are we still getting the right results? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Interesting. Interesting though. Like you always, it's funny that you say that, mate, is that you you go through st- individual times where like for example right now you know when we speak to a client you know i we're in we're at the you know the beginning slash end of the de- middle of december in yeah. 2023 when we're, we're recording this and it's funny a lot of people are asking me hey is a good time to put my home in the market i'm like hey guys i don't know that there's any better time for you to put your home on the marketplace um because at the end of the day inventory is already lower everywhere but now people are removing it for the holiday period you're basically going to be the only home on the marketplace so therefore supply mm-hmm. and demand says that your property is going to be more desirable at that point when there's less competition. Sure, there might be less people buying, but at the end of the day, there's when there's more people looking at buying, there's more supply, and then that normal law applies. So it's funny how like you take that, and I've said that for the last 10 years, you know what I mean? Like, like it happens every time around this time of year because I believe in it, but also it's funny how little things in market-driven cases, you should always have different elements of your business, like you said, mate, and put individual things at play at those individual times with those 90-day reviews and those people that are holding you accountable. Yeah, and it just gives you a leg up. I mean, preparation is the greatest key to success. The more prepared you are, the better opportunities you're going to have. And I think you know, honestly, most realtors are the most unprepared industry ever. We show up and we wing it. We've got these, you know, a listing appointment, which is technically a twenty, thirty thousand dollar meeting, and we show up doing this. We hope it's going to work. You know, it's the preparation you put into everything. And business planning is no different. If you are planning right now for what you're about to do in March, well, whatever happens in March, you're going to be a lot more prepared for it than anybody else in the industry. It doesn't matter what it is. And if only half of it happens, great. If you're preparing for potential negatives and threats that could happen in your business, if it doesn't happen, great. But if it does. It doesn't become such a huge impact on your business. But mm. hey, there's nothing like planning. I mean, people hate it because we actually have to sit down and think about what we're going to do. But, you know, it eliminates a lot of this angst and anxiety about what's going on in our market. And having a clear, decisive plan of what you're going to do keeps keeps the noise very quiet, stops you focusing on the externals that you can't control. So business plan has a lot more to do with than just knowing what you're going to do. It gives you a pinpoint focus of where to go when you're having a shit day. Yeah. And for me, that's what the most valuable thing with you know with the business plan was is you know when you start getting cloudy and start getting focused on things you shouldn't, it just gives me a place to go. Give you a you place know, to super go. simple, easy to focus on, 
But I do say keep them simple. I mean, I've seen some business plans over the last couple of months that just drive me bloody insane. I'm like, what the hell are you thinking about with this business plan? Because I mean, so you want to make a million dollars next year? You did two sales last year. There's a genius business plan. Let's see what we can do. There's no task changes. There's nothing different on it other than they've got a bigger number of what they want to earn. Yeah. It's and, like, and, like I, I find, you know, I, I, you're a numbers guy as well, mate. So I want to lean into this um, a little bit more. The, uh, the thing that I see, like, there's a couple of things I'm grateful for in the sense of like you and I being, you know, where we're from originally is that first of all, grateful from a perspective of we have only really ever known how to build a real estate business through listings. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very, very grateful for that considering the shift that might come through our marketplace. And again, whether that does make a significant change or it doesn't, still would rather a listing orientated business than a buyer orientated one. There's no question. Yep. But but the but the other thing is, is that mate, we really, maybe it's because of the smaller nature of the marketplaces that we're in, but also the highly competitive nature of where we're from, is that mm -hmm. a lot of people don't like, a lot of people don't really pick farm areas anymore. They don't pick individual areas they want to try and dominate. The agent has become somebody of some somewhat of a, you know, I'll go anywhere to do a deal sort of person. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you shouldn't be, but having those core markets or having a goal to get a certain market share of a particular market, and I just don't see it be as prevalent anymore. Um, so, and again, obviously you like, like I get it, but like, uh, but like I remember when my prospecting, Aaron, and I'm sure that you're going to give any similar example, Edenbrook and Windermere, two yeah. areas with inside like, and they weren't like an entire like, it's not like Newport Beach is my area. No, it was an individual uh, um, like area within that area, right, mm -hmm. where you would target and you wanted a certain market share and you would watch every listing that came on board and you would know whose listing it is and and you would feel like, oh, I didn't even get and, – and you would measure your business based on the perspective that, well, did they even call me for an opinion of what, what I was thinking or not? Yep. You know, like yep. – and that would be the measure of how well you are doing within that core marketplace. Yeah. Like, do you, do you see a lot of that with all the, cause you would see a great deal more business plans than I, I do. You see a great more deal of agents than I do. Like, do you see some of the agents still doing that or do you see merit in that? Right. That's a really good question, buddy. Cause I won't work with you unless you do have one. Uh, okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> cause I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's the, it's the consistency thing. Like if I've got a focus point that I can go to every day and have a repetitive system that I operate, it's always going to produce results. And you know, if you're just, and hey, we're, we're deal people as well. I'll go anywhere and anywhere to sell a property, but I also need something that's going to help me on a rainy day. I need somewhere that I can go. However, the way that people get taught to farm over here is just absolutely ridiculous. Dropping a flyer once a month is not farming. There's a whole process around how it works. But for me, it's a non-negotiable. If I've got a significant producing realtor that I'm working with, if they don't have a farm, I'm not working with them because it becomes super reactive. It's, you know, all of a sudden your time gets away on you. And we have a farming strategy. It takes about 45 minutes, an hour a day to keep consistent with it and keep building it up. And, you know, I had an incredible real estate business when I was selling and the majority of that then was from having a 50% market share in an area that I had control over. You know, all my business didn't come from there, but when the market sucked, most of my business came from a place where I had, you know, knowledge. I had a brand. I had people knew who I was. And I tracked every single thing in my business, not based on how many deals I did, based on how many listing appointments I got in my farm area. How many mm. people knew me? How many people were getting exposed to what I did? And that became the absolute foundation of my business. So if I only sold homes in my farm, I was still going to do very, very well. And for me, anything that I got outside of my farm area became an added bonus and you know, kind of gravy on the top. But honestly, if people aren't farming and getting super consistent, people are never going to remember who you are. You know, it takes so many points of contact for people to go, you know what, I'm going to give this person a call. One thing I would suggest, though, like if farming's not on the table, one of the, the, the things that we always insist is farms are too big. We have these people with three, 4,000 home farm wow. areas. You can't get consistent with that. So we, hey, the, the sweet spot for us is 500 homes. Now, granted, a lot of farms are bigger than that, but 500 homes that are your target market zone. So if you are sending up marketing, it only goes to these 500 homes. You generally have to do a bit of research on it. Uh, we rolled out a research process um, some years ago, which has shown people how to determine what a farm is. It needs to be economical. Yeah. Um, and when I say that, economical, yeah, it's, that, it's got to have yeah, a turnover. It, yeah. Not yeah, just because it's not pretty homes. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 so, no. It's that reverse engineering. How long are people holding onto homes? You know, all of the, yeah, the average, average age turnover, of the person. All yeah, that yeah, sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah. It's, it's got to support your business. And I think one thing I would say, if you are doing some research on a farm area now, go back to 2017, 2018, 2019. Don't take the last four or five years as normal market stats. Normally, we say go and research the last 12 months. Don't do that because you're probably going to get very thrown off numbers. 
we're getting everybody to go back to 17, 18, 19, when it was a little bit more of a normalized sort of a market. That'll give you a better understanding what normal market turnover is. Yep. Target numbers about eight to 10%. You know, if you're choosing an area that's got five, 600 homes in it, eight to 10% turnover, there's enough volume happening to give you enough actions to do every day. So, um, buddy, it's a safety zone. And if yeah. you've got a good farm and you stick with it, it's absolutely going to be a wonderful foundation for your business moving forward because when the days get tough, you've always got somewhere to go. And the more you do it, the more consistent, it always builds a great reputation to produce great opportunities. So no, I insist on it. Well, mate, I think that we've given the, I think there's been a really good, well-rounded conversation around industry and then some planning stuff. I want to go into a little bit of personal stuff with you because I'm going to get better at doing this in the podcast. That's one of my commitments for 2024 is I want to ask our guests a little bit more about their personal routines and habits. And yep. I, I'm, 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 I've been over the last 12 to 18 months, I've just been really fascinated with like some life hack stuff, um, you know, like that people like, like I've found a few things for me that, you know, have worked incredibly well. So I want to ask you like from a routine perspective, I want to ask books, I want to ask podcasts. Podcasts. I want to ask, you know, some fitness regimes that you do, um, you know, just a life hack that if you want to share with everybody. But let's start off with how, where do you get most of your knowledge from, mate, what, from books that you want to recommend or podcasts that you listen to? Where do you find that resource? Shit, I thought you were going to ask me that question because I was looking really buff on camera and you're curious to know what my workout regime was. But you couldn't have picked a better time to ask me because, I, you know, I mean, I think we've with the last 12 months, you know, it's been very easy to get sidetracked. Um, you know, and I think you and I can both agree as we get older, it gets a little easier to get fat. So um, <laughs> I have made some pretty significant life changes over the last year. But information for me is this, it's curiosity. You know, and I think for me, if I'm looking for information, I'm going to look at multiple different sources. So hey, one thing I'm always going to do is I'm always going to ask questions and I'll, I'll research certain things from the banking sector or go to the real estate sector and I get multiple different opinions and then I sort of try and find a happy medium in the middle because not everybody's right. Um, yeah, I read a lot of books, um, a lot of stuff around motivation and human nature, to be honest with you at the moment, because I think that's the most unpredictable thing that we're dealing with is that people yep. have changed. Um, so I spend a lot of time on the human psychology part of it. Hey, in my business dealing with people, I've, I've got to really work out what you're going through first before I can sort of determine how I can help you. So um, I digest information a lot better listening to it than I do reading it. So big audio books fan, um, I travel a ton too, so it's a great way to digest the information. Um, a lot of podcasts. Um, Andrew Huberman's a big one that I'm, I'm listening to a lot at the moment. You know, just just ways to better perform. And I think, you know, the, the hardest thing I think we've struggled in the last 12 months is I don't think we see a lot of people operating at 100%. You know, we're pretty mm -hmm. burnt out. We're pretty tired. You've got to remember that's the best you're ever going to give anybody and that's all you can ever expect in return. So, you know, reading for me, not much. Um, I'm, I'm not a real big sit down and read type of person, but audio books, podcasts all the time. Funny enough, stop watching TV at night. Um, I might watch a few things or show here and there, but for me, it's podcasts and just listen to things that kind of change the thought process. So um, leaning more on the, you know, the health and fitness side of it, more the fact that I've just turned 50 and I want to make sure I can get a few more years under my belt. But <laughs> it's also a bit of a reality check that that use it or lose it is real. Yep. And you can be busy for so long, but then trying to get back on track is really hard. And then when you travel as much as I do, you start to never, ever affected me until I got a little bit older and I realized you started to get a little tired, you know, you started to get a little foggy in the head and, and you know, having to get up and present uh, made me make some pretty significant life changes, which I'm more than happy to share with you. Given yeah, the fact let's that I'm go. A lot further down. Yeah, so, let's go, let's go. Yeah, for me, it was um, one thing that I've always struggled with is sleep. You know, my brain works at a million miles an hour and I thought every single person, you know, these high-performing people can survive off three or four hours of oh. sleep a night. Um, and so me being researched, did some study on this and, and I was just watching, listening to a podcast and the guy said, you know, how many people on the face of the earth as a percentage do you think can operate at a hundred percent with less than six hours of sleep? Have has a stab in the dark. Has to be zero, right? It's as a percentage at zero. There's no, there's not a single human being that can operate on less than six hours of sleep. Now I was struggling to think of any night that I've actually had six hours of sleep. So I actually got, got an aura ring, which was something to track my sleep the restfulness, but what I was discovering, I wasn't shutting my brain down. I'm always you know, on my computer, I'm on my phone, I'm doing things right up till I go to sleep. So when I go to sleep, I'm still trying to digest that information. So I was bringing in habits of certain times where I'd get rid of my phone. Um, you know, like I, I would stop watching TV and shows like that at night because when I go to bed, I'm thinking about it. No TV when I go to bed, which is something I did from the time I was a child. Um, so getting to sleep a lot quicker. Man, the difference in my performance and the clarity in my head just from getting an average of about seven and a half to eight hours sleep a night, incredible. Sure, you got to go to bed a little bit earlier, but the volume of what we get through during a day is tenfold. So I started looking at my sleep, 
Um, start, went and got a lot of blood work done just to look at you know minerals and things like that. Um, started using a product called AG1, which is a drink you have in the morning. Love it, swear by it. If anybody wants a real good pickup, uh, it was developed by Kiwi, just so I found out the other day. So oh. a good Kiwi company. <laughs> so I didn't know that, but you know, it's a drink that you have in the morning. I'll let you know straight away. It tastes like shit, but you get used to it after a while. But it's the most complex vitamin thing ever. Just differences, um, you know, no achy bones, pains, things like that, little things that we all struggle with as we get older. Um, I go to F45 every morning, like a ritual. Been doing that for about three months now. Uh, lost a ton of weight, got a lot more physically fit, a um, lot more mobility, uh, no more aching back pains from sitting on a plane for two or three hours. Um, so just a lot of personal changes for me, like religious every day, um, you know, seven o'clock every morning up off to F45. Um, I'm home. I can schedule everything around it. Um, so it was just getting into the habit of doing some things a little different because I'm like no different to anybody. If I wake up in the morning, I've got a shitty email I've got to deal with. It's kind of where my brain goes. Um, so I generally won't start work till about eight o'clock now because if I do, I'm not going to do the things that I need to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've also found that the business has gone through the roof. The bit and I've been a lot more, you know, mentally and physically connected to it because you can be busy, you can be tired, but your performance and your results are going to show. Yeah. And so, I mean, I've been doing this for six, seven months. Justine's been into it as well. Um, she looks like she's about ready for a triathlon, but you know, just just super different things. Eating well. One of the rules that she gave me: nothing out of a bag. So all our foods, kind of whole food stuff. Um, and I've got to be honest, I'm one of those skeptical people, you know, I'm, I'm a typical man where I'll be fine. I'll heal over everything. Just the personal changes, buddy, have been incredible. And, and as good. you get older, it's a lot harder to keep it there. But I, I know you and I talk about this a lot, but you know, it was one of those things that I, I, I wanted to keep to myself because I had to challenge myself to do it. Cause I'm like everybody, I can always make an excuse to go and work. You know, you and yeah. I've got a very similar work ethic where there's always something super important to do, but there's nothing more important than getting ourselves to be able to give 100% of the best version of ourselves to people that we're either in a relationship with or that we're working with. I mean, honestly, if you feel good, you sound good, you're, you know, you're, you're connected, you show up, you look good, you're always going to get some great opportunities. If you look tired and worn out, I am not trusting my number one asset with you. No, that's absolutely right, mate. Well, I'm glad yeah. to hear that all of that's going really well. And thank you for sharing it with the audience yeah. because I think that, you know, that's part of, you know, part of life is obviously the way that we, the way that we execute it, but it's also the preparation that you give yourself and you, the, you've got to give yourself, like you've already said, mate, is that the greatest opportunity to succeed. But Aaron, thanks for joining us again on Rethink Real Estate, mate. Absolutely phenomenal <laughs> right. episode. We'll push everybody into 2024 and put them on the downhill roll, mate, so that yeah, it right. makes Don't it easy. Don't forget to remove the problems. Problems never go away. And if you can, if you can mitigate three or four things that have just caused you issues in the last 12 months first thing you've got is creation of space to be able to put something in there that's actually going to benefit you and help you grow there's no success in being busy there's none of it if you're busy and no result it's because you're doing a lot of things that aren't producing so i appreciate the invite ben as always it's a great pleasure to talk to you and uh you know really hope people got some value from it thank you mate cheers so about 75 percent of our audience hasn't liked followed or subscribed to our podcast it would mean the world to us and it would help this podcast more than you know to expand our reach if you were to like, follow or subscribe on any of the platforms that you're watching or listening on. Thanks again.